Welcome back. Concerns about FDR's health, they were growing, but the war was still raging and there was still much work to do. And that led to one of the most iconic moments in the Roosevelt presidency. We spoke about that and more in part two of my interview with David Woolner, author of the book, The Last 100 Days, FDR at War and at Peace. It's famous, the interesting dynamic with he and Eleanor, but also in the book, Anna, his daughter emerges as a pivotal, uh, not only gatekeeper for him, but also um, in many ways, he comes across almost as lonely. I mean, who yeah, else can relate lonely. to where he is at that point? And she made sure that there was people who didn't want something necessarily from him that he could trust and that let down his guard here, which was invaluable when you literally have the weight of the world in your shoulders. Exactly. You know, he used to call himself Exhibit A. He'd say, I'm tired of being Exhibit A. And he, he, he liked to relax with people who didn't have an agenda. And there were very few people that he could relax with. Um, and Anna is, is critical. I mean, she's the one who, more than any other person in his entourage, I mean, Eleanor was concerned too, but uh, she's the one who really pushes for the medical exam by a team of doctors in the spring of 44, and that's when they discover he really is much more seriously ill than anybody had thought. Um, and she's also the one who tries to protect him in these final months. And, uh, you know, again, uh, she goes to Yalta. She's trying to screen people from, from overwhelming him. And, you know, I in a way, she even kind of intercedes between him and Harry Hopkins, people of, of that significant stature. Yep. You know, she's really going to be the person to, to try to look after him. So it, it, it is, it's a very important and fascinating uh, role that she plays. And I don't know, I just couldn't help when I see through the lens of FDR as to what he was trying to do with the UN, but more importantly, the role of the United States in the world. Um, and if anything, he was trying to push back on the idea of America first. Yeah, absolutely. And you fast forward more than 70 years later to where we are now, and the commander in chief with his view of America first, uh, denigrating both not only the UN, but our allies, uh, our role in the world where we shouldn't be, maybe some will describe it to Steve Bannon, but regardless, the messaging sent from this White House um, to the world versus the messaging that FDR was trying to do back then, yeah. my God, have things changed in a few generations. They have changed, they have changed. You know, there's, there's so many critical uh, moments in his presidency uh, where he tries to educate the American people about the dangers of the world and so forth. And one of the most remarkable uh, fireside chats, probably second only to the one he gives on banking uh, in March of 33, mm -hmm. is this remarkable fireside chat in February of 1942, where he actually has announced to the American people in advance to buy world maps. And it's the largest sale of National Geographic maps in the history of the, of the magazine. And he gets on the radio, his fireside chat, and he says, now take out your maps. And he tries to explain that this is a war on every continent, every sea lane, and then very importantly, every air lane in the world. And he had published, purposely published, global perspective maps. And if you look at the polar projection maps, you see that the United States is very close to the Eurasian continent. It's not very far away, and when you fly over the pole, uh, the, the message is, of course, we're, we're much more vulnerable than... Yeah. Uh, we than got skin in this, yeah. The other thing that's critical is that his generation, and he's not alone in this, fully understood that the reason we had fascism, the reason you see the rise of characters like Adolf Hitler, is because of the economic crisis of the 1930s. So you have to fix the world's economy if you're going to avoid another cataclysmic war. And believe me, he understood. You, you don't go through that Second World War without realizing the, the, the unbelievable uh, violence of that conflict. I uh, mean, forget about the atomic bomb. I'm mean, just talking about the bombing of cities right. and the kind of warfare that we were talking about. He was convinced that the world could not survive another world war, even without the bomb. So, you know, American security is, is tied to the security of the rest of the world, and the security of the rest of the world is tied to freedom from want. So the United and States and has to play a moral role in the And world. even closer to home, what I took away from this was obviously, you know, a fair and living wage here, and he welcomed the enmity of the bankers. Yeah. Um, yeah. And... Again, fast forward to today and the debates we're having over certain uh, tax cut proposals or tax reform, however you want to frame it. To that end, I'm really curious. And without blowing sunshine, you have read more of both the private notes, all the speeches, all the correspondence during um, all the FDR terms. 
if he teleported back today and could just be a fly on the wall seeing with what's going on and how the role of the United States is being reimagined in real time in HD, mm. what do you think he'd say? Do you think he'd say, hey, this is yet another fever that'll pass for America? Or would he be really worried about the consequences in the future here that there could be some lasting scars? Well, he gave an incredible speech on Monopoly in uh, 1938. And he said in the opening of that speech, let me, let me quote this. He said, unhappy events abroad have taught us two simple truths about democracy. The first is that the liberty of a democracy is not safe if the people tolerate the growth of private power to the point that it becomes stronger than the democratic state itself. That, in essence, is fascism. You know, this idea that a small group yep. or uh, moneyed interests can actually gain control of the government itself, which is, of course, something he, he spoke about at great length in the, in the mid-1930s. And the second truth, he said, is that the liberty of democracy is not safe if its business system does not provide employment and produce and distribute goods in such a way as to sustain an acceptable standard of living for its people. So I think, you know, if, if we're going to look at, at issues like the, the current system we're in now and the current tax proposals ahead of us, in, in front of us, and the whole um, emphasis on taking care of the one percent that we've seen in the in the past uh, few decades, um, I think he would argue that this is a non-sustainable system that, that we're we're going to lose our hold on democracy, and and some people would say we're already losing our hold on democracy. So I think it's very very serious. You know, we forget that Roosevelt was not a socialist. Roosevelt set out to save capitalism. I mean, those bankers on Wall Street should bless you know bless him every day of the week. It's Roosevelt that says, how do we make capitalism work for the average American? You know, how do we regulate the stock market? How do we provide bank insurance, you know, deposit mm -hmm. insurance? Things like this, very common sense ideas to, to make sure that the little guy uh, didn't lose out in this, this system, this free market system that we, that we embrace. Um, and so to have a, a government in place that essentially redistributes wealth upwards instead of downwards, you know, I think he would be uh, absolutely appalled. And uh, one of the things you get, which is unmistakable, is he did view himself as a public servant. Um, Absolutely. And he didn't feel he was beholden to certainly the ruling class. He certainly wouldn't have checked with them as to which policies and how to write them, et cetera. And in fact, he liked a good fight. Um, but, um, but yeah, I'd be very curious, I think, uh, if he got to comment on the events of 2017, what he'd say. Yeah, and, and he was a populist. Except yeah. he was a populist that urged the American people to banish fear. And we're living in an age now where our leaders are saying that we should embrace fear. Uh, it's quite a different phenomenon. And some of the worst things that go along with it. Um, the book, again, The Last 100 Days, FDR at War and at Peace. David, as always, it's great to see you. And uh, good luck with the book. It's a fascinating read and, and in many ways certainly timely, given what we're seeing uh, going on as we speak. Thank you, Rich. All right, coming up next, we switch gears. Theater critic John Simon, he joins us with his review of M. Butterfly, starring Clive Owen. It's a story of sex, intrigue, and politics, and it's getting rave reviews.